Something that's striking about chatbots is the number of them. Intelligent agents and virtual companions, there aren't very many of them because they're quite complex to build. Chatbots, because they have a much more narrow focus, people can think of applications for them much more easily, and the development platforms for them are really quite accessible. So we've seen a huge chatbot rise. In 2015, we saw Facebook M. That was one of the first sort of well-known chatbots. And then a, a development platforms coming from Facebook, Microsoft, Line, IBM, and so on, that really sort of spurred on this development to the point where we were having hundreds of thousands of chatbots, and companies like Slack were even introducing development funds. And analysts like Gartner were making some pretty strong statements saying, in the next few years, we'll see 50% of enterprises spending more on bots than they do on apps. So there's a real surge here. But if you move forward a couple of years to sort of where we are now, you can see some challenges starting to emerge. And, and even last year, and this is what started some of the conversation for Jonathan and I at Kai last year, was you could see people beginning to raise some questions around bots are in the marketplace, but they're not really meeting the expectations. And there was some disappointment starting to creep in. Although the trend is still positive and they continue to be um, really um, useful and the growth continues. But you do see things like Facebook M shut down. And then people asking questions like David Feldman, who was one of the sort of principal uh, developers for Facebook M, asking questions about what happened to chatbots. So Jonathan and I were thinking about this, and we, we have a theory for this, which is this is probably the Gartner hype cycle taking place. You know, in the beginning, there's a lot of excitement. People rush in. A lot of bots are being developed. But then there's this point where either you reach saturation or some expectations are not being met, so we start to dip. And so we're in what Gartner would call this trough of disillusionment. But the really encouraging thing about this that we feel is it can work its way back up again. And it can work up to what Gartner would call the plateau of productivity. So then the question becomes, how do we move forward along the slope of enlightenment and into the plateau of productivity? So this is where Jonathan and I were sort of reflecting on what are, what are the things that we've learned from looking at the literature and from our own experiences of developing these chatbots and working on agents? So here are some things that we think, there are, there are more than this, but here are some things that we think really lead to uh, success when developing chatbots. So keeping a really narrow focus really helps and finding areas that are specific markets so again, thinking about things like a, uh, a, a travel agent and being able to hit, help people with travel recommendations or maybe even kind of book a flight. When things are really specific like that, they're really kind of uh, helpful. The other thing that was quite striking, and this is where we get into the conversation about Humbots, was we realized that many times bots are actually continuing to reach out to humans too. And that was kind of an interesting kind of aha moment because I think a lot of the industry is trying to enable bots and agents to go it alone, to just be the tech on itself. And maybe the tech's not really ready for some of the things we want it to do. So there's nothing wrong with having a human in the loop and embracing this idea of Humbots. So just to talk about this, this one a little bit further, there was a paper a couple of years ago around a bot called calendar.help. And this was a bot that was to help people develop uh, um, or rather book meetings. It's a pain point that a lot of us have. It seems like it's a really straightforward task. You know where the rooms are, you know the people, you know the time and so on. But it turned out to be surprisingly difficult. And this is what Cranshaw and folks were talking about a couple of years ago in this Kai paper. And they actually found that 
only 5% of the successful meetings booked could, only, could be done by the tech alone. And that humans had to be in the loop the rest of the time. And they ended up developing an escalation path which had different levels of human involvement. But this is a good example of how humans and technology can continue to work together and, and deal with some of the challenges we're starting to uh, experience in the area. So in terms of um, uh, further challenges, um, so like calendar.help was showing us, even the simplest task can often be quite complex. You can easily get into a situation where if you don't maintain boundaries on what the task is, you get mission creep. And either the user is not sure about what the bot can do, or the bot itself is starting to creep into other areas. The travel bot, for instance, could start um, uh, finding activities that are unrelated to travel. I think we talk about this one a lot in the, in the field, but conversation and natural language is surprisingly difficult. Um, as humans, we've been doing this for a really long time, and so we're experts, so the bar is really, really high. Along with that come questions around trust and transparency, uh, personality, and especially during the first run experience. It's, it's really critical that people have a good sense of where information is going, if necessary, how to retrieve information, and they just feel that the experience is trusted, especially when it's easy to make chatbots on development platforms. You don't know who's making these things unless you, you communicate that information. And then the last challenge that we wanted to call out was one we call the demo trap. So this goes back to we've made some pretty good platforms to develop bots, and it's fairly straightforward to make them. But to be successful, it's not just about making it and getting into, into the marketplace. It's about working afterwards to see how the data is being, to, how, how the, the product is being used, looking at the data that's being worked on, and really continuing to improve. So what does all this mean for the future? Well, like we started at the beginning, oftentimes it's best to look back so we can look back to some work that Licklider did in the 1960s again, and he created these three stages of human-computer uh, interaction. The first phase was um, beginning in the 1960s and has continued forward to about where we are right now. And the second phase is moving into this area of around human-computer partnerships. It's probably the phase that we're in right now and it's hard to define how that's going to go and how long it's going to last, but Lick Lido said it could last 10 to 500 years, and it should be intellectually the most creative and enticing uh, it, it part in, in history of uh, humanity. So um, that's a long period of time, but it's kind of encouraging because it will also mean that conferences like this probably will keep going for 500 years as we work it all out. And then phase three is what Licklider calls the ultra-intelligent machine, which is the period where we'll get to the full general artificial intelligence. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. <laughs> If you have a question, please come to the microphone and introduce yourself. Ben Schneiderman, University of Maryland. Thank you. Interesting review. Could you, or did you in your discussions or taxonomy look for the places where instead of the agent doing it in collaboration, that the person did it themselves? I mean, I see that for a lot of tasks, people... The, the, the different kind of interfaces enable them to do it themselves, like making flight reservations or a lot of different tasks. So what is the, uh, under what circumstances is it better for a person to do it themselves and when is it better for a conversational agent to help them? Yeah. Um, 
I can't, I can't say that we have a direct answer for doing that. I think it's a really good place to investigate next. Um, the, the thing that we were generally finding goes back to how complex tasks are. And there were very many places where it was good to have human involvement or at least some, some level of curation by, by the human. So there ended up being a lot of places where um, humans needed to be uh, involved. So I, I think as we take this forward, I think the, the human and bot partnership would be really I'm not suggesting out. that. I'm let's say where the human user does it themselves, not as an, not as another human help, but they do it themselves in a visual interface. Oh, I see. Yeah. No, we, we should look at that further. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm a cloud pianist from IBM Research. When we looked in our research into these issues, we also see what we think there is another dimension, which is the speech verse versus chatbot text, mm -hmm. and how that sort of sort of make the map into those categories and, and creates in in a non non equal way. And I wonder if you have looked into this issue. Can you say more about what you mean by speech? Uh, like, like Alexa, what? like yeah. using speech uh, chat, speech based chatbots versus. Chat, chat, text-based chatbots. Right. Like the difference. That, let me give you an example. When most of most of intelligence systems are going the direction of speech, mm -hmm. while most of the chatbots today are in the text world. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we wonder what why is going there and uh, what happens in the the, the two empty dimensions of this. I'm not sure if I'm being clear. Uh, you, you, yes, I, th I think so. Um, I think I think part of I think we're at a transition phase right now where um, intelligence assistants are moving much more towards a, 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 an audio speech based way. Um, I could see chatbots starting to go more in that direction as we move forward too. So, so I, it's hard to say what, what the reasons are for that, okay. but I, I, I can see why you're saying that. Okay. Hi, uh, Mark Schlager from Google. Um, there seems to be assumption in here that chatbots are going to be talking to humans and humans to chatbots. Have, did you think about a future in which my chatbot talks to your chatbot and I'm out of the loop? Yes. We, we didn't cover that in here, but we have been thinking about this a lot in terms of what are all the relationships that could happen between one chatbot to another chatbot, the chatbot to a um, intelligence assistant, and then also what it means to have the human involved in that too. Um, I think that's going to be one of the next phases that we as a, a discipline start to investigate further because it gets complex really quickly uh, trying to figure out what those, what those combinations are but also what the relationships are as well. So yeah, yeah thank you for bringing that one up. Let's thank Richard again for the great talk.